Hello class, this is Dr. Palmer. Today we're going to be looking at political parties, which in your book is chapter 8. Here's some brief uh, contents of the chapter. And some of their, our goals here today in this lecture is we are going to identify the functions that political parties perform in American democracy determine the significance of party identification in America today. We'll describe how political parties are organized in the United States. We'll evaluate how well political parties generally do in carrying out their promises. We'll differentiate the various party eras in American history and assess both the impact of third parties on American politics and their limitations. And finally, we'll evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of responsible party government. Party competition is the battle between Democrats and Republicans for control of public office. Without this competition, there would be no choice. Without choice, there would be no democracy. Political parties endorse candidates for public office and try to win elections. Party leaders often disagree about policy, and between elections, the parties are nearly invisible. Political science scientists often view parties as three-headed political giants. The party in the electorate, the party as an organization, and the party in government. The party in the electorate are individuals who perceive themselves as party members. Many voters have a party identification that guides and influences their votes. Unlike many European political parties, American parties do not require dues or membership cards to, dis dis to distinguish them from non-members. To be a member of a party, one needs only to claim to be a member. The party as an organization has a national office, a full-time staff, rules and bylaws, and, and budgets. Party activists keep the party running between elections and make its rules. Although American parties are loosely organized at the national, state, and local levels, the party organization pursues electoral victory. The party in government consists of elected officials who call themselves members of the party, such as president and congress. These leaders do not always agree on policy, but they are the main spokespersons of the party. Tasks in the parties. In a large democracy, linkage institutions translate inputs from the public into outputs from the policymakers. Tasks performed by parties as linkage institutions include parties picking policymakers. A nomination is the party's endorsement of a candidate. Parties run campaigns. Although parties coordinate the campaigns, recent technology has made it easier for candidates to campaign on their own. Parties give cues to voters. Even though party ties have weakened, most voters have a party image of each party, and many voters still rely on a party to give them cues for voting. Parties articulate policies. Within the electorate and in the government, each political party advocates specific policy alternatives. Parties coordinate policymaking. Each office holder is also a member of a party and the first place they look for support is to their fellow partisans. Parties, Voters, and Policy, the Downs Model. Anthony Downs has provided a working model of the relationship among voters, parties, and policy, employing a rational choice perspective. Rational choice theory assumes that parties and political actors have goals, such as winning elections, that are more important to the party than ideology. If both parties and voters are rational, both will try to select the best way to achieve their goals. In order to win an office, the wise party pursues policies that have broad public appeal. The majority of American electorate are in the middle, and successful parties in the U.S. rarely stray from the midpoint of public opinion. Although we frequently hear criticisms that there is not much difference between the Democrats and Republicans, the two parties have little choice given the nature of the American political market. 
From a rational choice perspective, one should expect the parties to differentiate themselves to some extent. The two parties have to forge different identities in order to build voter loyalty. Figure 8.1 shows the Downs model, how rational parties position themselves near, but not at, the center of public opinion. In 2008, the American National Election Study asked a sample of American population to classify themselves on a seven-point scale from extremely liberal to extremely conservative. The graph shows how respondents who, vote, who reported voting for president located themselves on this scale. Respondents who said they didn't know are included in the middle category, as the parties have to assume that these voters are up for grabs in the center. The arrows indicate how the typical voter placed the two major parties on the same scale. The party in the electorate. The party in the electorate consists largely of symbolic images. There is no formal membership in American parties. For most people, the party is a psychological label. Party images help shape people's party identification, the self-proclaimed preferences for one of the parties. The clearest trend in party identification over the last four decades has been the decline of both parties and the resultant upsurge of independents, mostly at the expense of Democrats. Virtually every major social group, except African American voters, has moved towards a position of increased independence. By contrast, African Americans have moved even more sol solidly into the Democratic Party. Currently, only 5% of African Americans identify themselves as Republicans. Figure 8.2, Party Identification in the United States. Political analysts and scholars carefully monitor changes in the distribution of party identification. Below you see the percentages of population who have identified themselves as Democrats, Independents, and Republicans during each presidential election year from 1952 to 2008. Party affiliation is an important part of political identity. The party in the electorate. Party identification remains strongly linked to the voter's choice, but ticket splitting, or voting with one party from one office and another for other offices, is near an all-time high. Not only are there more independents now, but those who still identify with a party are no longer as loyal in the voting booth as they once were. Divided government has frequently been the result, often with Republican control of the White House and Democratic control of Congress. American political parties are decentralized and fragmented. Unlike many European parties, formal party organizations in America have little power to enforce their decisions by offering rewards, like campaign funds and appointments, to office holders who follow the party line and punishing those who do not. Candidates in the United States can get elected on their own, and the party organization is relegated to a relatively limited role. Local parties. Urban party organizations are no longer very active. At one time, the urban political party was the basis of political party organization in America. From the late 19th century through the New Deal of the 1930s, scores of, of cities were nominated by party machines, uh, which is a party organization that depends on material inducements such as patronage, in which jobs were awarded for political reasons rather than for merit or competence. Mayor Richard J. Daley ruled the city of Chicago from 1955 until his death in 1976. The 50 State Party System American national parties are a loose aggregation of state parties, which in turn are a fluid association of individuals, groups, and local organizations. 
There are 50 state party systems. No two are exactly alike. Parties in some states, states such as Pennsylvania, are well organized, have sizable staffs, and spend a lot of money, while parties in other states such as California are very weak. The states are allowed great discretion in the regulation of party activities, and how they choose to organize elections influences the strength of the parties profoundly. States determine how easy it is to participate in nomination contests by their adoption of closed primaries, open primaries, or blanket primaries. The National Party Organizations the national convention of each party meets every four years to write the party's platform and nominate its candidates for president and vice president. The national committee, composed of representatives from the states and territories, keeps the party operating between conventions. Day-to-day -day activities of the national party are the responsibility of the national chairperson. The Party in Government, Promises and Policy Party control does matter because each party and the elected official who represent it generally try to turn campaign promises into action. Since candidates are now much less dependent upon parties to get nominated and elected, party control has weakened. In addition, presidents are now less likely to play the role of party leader, and members of Congress are less eminent uh, amenable to being led. Voters and coalitions of voters are attracted to different parties largely, though not entirely, by their performance and policies. The parties have done a fairly good job over the years of translating their platform promises into public policy. The impression that politicians and parties never produce policy out of promises is largely incorrect. Although few people actually read party platforms, they are one of the best written sources for what the parties believe in. A brief summary of some of the contrasting positions in the Democratic and Republican platforms of 2008 here illustrates major differences in beliefs between the two parties. In contrast to the United States, most democratic nations have more than two parties represented in their national legislature. Throughout American history, one party has been the dominant majority party for long periods of time, referred to as party eras. Party eras are punctuated by critical elections in which new issues appeared that divided the electorate and party coalitions underwent realignment. A party realignment, which is a rare event, is typically associated with a major crisis or trauma in the nation's history, such as the Civil War, the Great Depression, both of which led to realignments. A new coalition, or a set of individuals or groups supporting the party, is formed for each party, and the coalition endures for many years. A critical election period may require more than one election before change is apparent, but the party system will be transformed in such a period. Party eras in American history, 1796 to 1824, the first party system. Alexander Hamilton was probably the person most instrumental in establishing the first party system. Hamilton needed congressional support for policies he favored, particularly a national bank, and the foundation of the Federalist Party came from his politicking and coalition building. The Federalists were America's shortest-lived party. They were poorly organized, they faded after John Adams was defeated in his re-election bid of 1800, and they no longer even had a candidate for president after 1820. The Democratic Republicans, also known as the Jeffersonians, replaced the Federalists. The Democratic-Republican coalition was der derived from agrarian interest, which made the party popular in the rural South, but the coalition was torn apart by factionalism.
1828 to 1856, Jackson and the Democrats versus the Whigs. General Andrew Jackson founded the modern American political party when he forged a new coalition in 1828. Jackson was originally a Democratic Republican, but soon after his election, his party became known simply as the Democratic Party, which continues to this day. Jackson's successor, Martin Van Buren, was a realist who argued that, governing, uh, argued that a governing party needed a loyal opposition to represent other parts of society. This opposition was provided by the Whigs, but the Whig party was only able to win the presidency when it nominated popular military heroes such as William Henry Harrison in 1840 and Zachary Taylor in 1848. The Whigs had two distinct wings, northern industrialists and southern planters, who were brought together more by the democratic policies they opposed than by issues on which they agreed. As we continue the party eras in American history, we look at the period 1860 to 1928, the two Republican eras. The issue of slavery dominated American politics and split both the Whigs and the Democrats in the 1850s. The Republican Party rose in the late 1850s as the anti-slavery party. The Republicans forged a coalition out of the remnants of several minor parties and elected Abraham Lincoln as president in 1860. The Civil War brought a party realignment, and the, Repu and the Republican Party was in ascendancy for more than 60 years, though the Democrats controlled the South. The election of 1896 was a watershed during this era, a period when party coalitions shifted and the Republicans were, in were in entrenched for another generation. The Republicans continued as the nation's majority party until the stock market crash of 1929 and the ensuing Great Depression. The election of 1860 proved to be a realigning election. Having only been formed six years earlier in 1854, the Republican Party suddenly became the nation's majority party with the victory of the Lincoln-Hamlin ticket. The period of 1932 to 1964, the New Deal Coalition. President Herbert Hoover's handling of the Great Depression was disastrous for the Republicans. He took the position that economic depression cannot be cured by legislative action. Franklin D. Roosevelt promised a new deal and easily defeated Hoover in 1932. Congress passed scores of Roosevelt's anti-depression measures during his first 100 days in office. Party realignment began in earnest after the Roosevelt administration got the country mu moving again and Roosevelt forged the New Deal coalition for many such diverse groups as union members, southerners, intellectuals, liberals, the poor, and African Americans. Party coalitions today. The two parties continue to draw support from very different social groups, many of which have existed since the New Deal era. This figure shows the percentage identifying as Democrats and Republicans for various groups in, in 2008. Nineteen sixty eight to present. Southern realignment and the era of divided party government. The New Deal coalition has weakened, especially due to the erosion of the former solid Democratic South as, a conser as conservative Democrats became increasingly unsatisfied with their national party. Today the South is now strongly Republican, whereas there are fewer Republicans in the Northeast and the, and the Pacific Coast. An unprecedented, unprecedented period of divided government, when the executive and legislative branches are controlled by different parties, has existed since 1968. 
it is likely that divided party government will be a regular phenomenon as, at both the federal and the state levels. Party de-alignment means that people are gradually moving away from both political parties. Many political scientists believe that the recent pattern of divided government means that the party system has de-aligned rather than realigned. Many scholars fear that the parties are becoming useless and ineffective through the pattern of divided government and de-alignment. Conversely, there are also some signs of party renewal, such as the increase in regular Washington staff of the national party organizations. The recent de-alignment has been characterized by growing party neutrality. Many voters are indifferent towards both of the parties. Those who do identify with a party are more likely to belong to the party that matches their ideology. The parties have become ideologically differentiated, and people who call themselves conservatives are more likely to be in the Republican Party, while those while those who uh, consider themselves liberal are concentrated in the Democratic Party. Even though party loyalty has lagged, party organizations have become more energetic and effective. The parties learned the secrets of high-tech fundraising. The party's national, congressional, and senatorial campaign committees are now wealthier, more stable, better organized, and better staffed. Third parties, their impact on American politics. There are three basic varieties of third parties. Parties that promote certain causes, either a controversial single issue such as prohibition of alcoholic beverages or an extreme ideological position such as socialism or libertarianism. Splinter parties that are offshoots of a majority party, such as Teddy Roosevelt's progressives in 1912, Strom Thurmond's states writers uh, or the Dixiecrats in 1948, and George Wallace's American Independence in 1968. Parties, are, uh, parties that are an extension of a popular individual with presidential aspirations, including John Anderson in 1980 and Ross Perot in 1992 and 1996. Third party candidates usually struggle to get noticed in the United States as Almost all major elected officials are affiliated either with the Democrats or the Republicans, but occasionally a third-party candidate will become a serious contender, as did Lincoln Chaffee when he ran uh, uh, unsuccessfully for governor of Rhode Island in 2010. The Importance of Third Parties Third parties have controlled enough votes in one-third of the last 36 presidential elections to have decisively tipped the electoral college vote. For example, if Ralph Nader did not run in 2000, exit polls show quite conclusively that Al Gore would have been elected. They have brought new groups into the electorate and have served as safety valves for popular discontent. They have brought new issues to the political agenda. The most obvious consequence of two-party governance is the moderation of political conflict. With just two parties, both will cling to a centrist position to maximize their appeal to voters. The result is often political ambiguity. Parties will not want to risk taking a strong stand on a controversial policy if doing so will only antagonize many voters, as with Goldwater in 1964 and McGovern in 1972. One of the major reasons the United States has only two parties representing in government is structural. America has a winner-take-all system. In this system, the party that receives a plurality, or more votes than anyone else, even though it, might, uh, it may be less than majority, is declared the winner. The other parties get nothing. This system discourages small parties because they never get a foothold in government upon which to build for the future. In a system that uses proportional representations used in most European countries, legislative seats are allocated roughly according to each party's percentage of the nationwide vote. 
In most countries, parties must achieve a certain small percentage of votes to be awarded any seats in the legislature. This generally excludes extremist parties. A coalition government is created when two or more parties combine their numbers to form a majority of seats in a national legislature. This form of government is quite common in the multi-party systems of Europe. Political parties are considered essential elements of democratic government. Democracy and responsible party government. How should we govern? Ideally, in a democracy, candidates should say what they mean to do if elected and are able to do what they promised once they are elected. Critics of the American party system complain that this is all too often not the case and have called for a more disciplined, responsible party system. The responsible party model calls for each party to present distinct, comprehensive programs, carried out carry out its program if elected, implement its program if it is the majority party, or state what it would do if it were in power, and accept responsibility for the performance of the government. Under this model, a party's officeholders would have firm control of the government, and they would be collectively, rather than individually, responsible for their actions. American parties do not meet the criteria of the responsible party model. They are too decentralized to take a single national position and then enforce it. Because virtually anyone can vote in party primaries, parties do not have control over those who run under their labels. There are supporters of America's two-party system who criticize the responsible party model. They argue that the complexity and diversity of American society needs a different form of representation. Local differences need an outlet for expression. America's decentralized parties are appropriate for the type of limited government the founders sought to create and most Americans wish to maintain. Blue Dog Democrats are fiscally conservative Democrats who are mostly from the South and rural parts of the United States and are resistant to any domestic policy proposals that would enlarge the scope of government. Thus, on congressional votes like the $787 billion economic stimulus package or the even more expensive health care proposal, many Blue, Blue Dog Democrats did not support President Obama's initiatives. There are, they, there are supporters of American two-party system who criticize the responsible party model. Weak parties limit the scope of government in America because the president cannot command party discipline to pass important legislation such as health care. Because no single party can ever be said to have firm control over the government, the hard choices necessary to cut back on existing government spending are rarely addressed. Divided government has meant that neither party is really in charge, and each points the finger at each other. In summary, Political parties are a key linkage between policymakers and people. They operate in the electorate, as organizations, and in government. And political parties pick candidates, run campaigns, give cues to voters, articulate policies, and coordinate policymaking between the, the branches of government. Here's your lecture quiz. Please fill it out and reply through the EDU system.